Hi class, we're going to try something new today by recording these lectures on our computers and then posting them to YouTube uh, due to the snow day. And so I'm going to cover module 5 and 7 and John is going to cover module 6. Uh, and so this is the start of module 5. And today we're going to be talking about data input and output as well as additional information about subsetting. And I'm Andrew Jaffe, the instructor. And so while it's nice to be able to put in a variety of data formats, it's equally important to be able to output data somewhere. So the workhorse for this function is write.table. Uh, essentially, you, um, it prints a required argument x, uh, which is what you provide, and it's converted to a data frame if it's not one, or a matrix, and it sends it to a file on your computer. Uh, just like read.table, there's a bunch of options and, and customizations that you can perform to change how the output looks. Um, for example, what the data is separated by, uh, what missing variables are considered, and what the decimal place is, whether to provide row names or column names. Uh, and so, essentially, x, the object x in that, in, that, um, in that help file is the R data frame or matrix you want to write. File is the file name where you want the R object to be written. You can either have it as an absolute path or a file name uh, locally, um, and that which basically writes the file to your working directory. And then sep is what character separates the columns. Uh, for example, commas is, is a CSV. And note there's also a write.csv function. And backslash t is, an, is a tab in Linux, and that's tab delimited. So note for many data frames, um, row names are just numbers, just the number of the row index. So I like the setting this to false because I typically email these to people who open them in Excel. Then you have the row name as a number basically there already. And so from the, um, the homework 2 data set, sorry, homework 2 data set, uh, if you read in the Charm City Circulator and filter down to, and subset down to having the day, the date, and then the average riderships on each line plus daily ridership, here this is an example of using write.csv where I'm saving this reduced data set um, to a file uh, in a subfolder called data. I'm saving it as Charm City Circ underscore reduced dot CSV. Um, note it's uh, encapsulated in quotes. And I'm saying row.names equals false. And so note that row.names equals true uh, would make the first column contain the row names, which are here just the numbers, one to the number of rows of the data, which is not very useful for Excel. Um, note that row names can be useful or informative in R if they contain information, uh, but then you could also just make them a separate column before writing it out. And so uh, many data analysts collaborate with researchers who use Excel, uh, particularly me with biologists, for example, um, who like to enter and curate their data. Um, oftentimes, this is the input data for analysis. Therefore, have two options for getting this data into R. When you're within Excel, um, you can save a sheet as a CSV file and then read it in using read.csv. Uh, or you can use an add-on package called XLSX. Um, if I typically have just one Excel spreadsheet that has a single um, page, I typically just save the spreadsheet as a CSV. Um, however, if the XLS XLSX file has multiple well-formatted worksheets, you can use the XLSX package for reading in each of the data worksheets. And so that's uh, a good segue into talking about packages a little bit. Um, packages are essentially add-ons provided by users in the community or other researchers that are commonly written that are comprised of uh, a combination of functions, data, and or vignettes, or little examples of how you use the particular package. When you have a package already installed, uh, you can invoke it using the library or require functions. And that basically loads the package, all the material in the package into your workspace and our memory, so you can use its functions. If you do not have a package installed and you want to install it off of um, the CRAN repository, you can use the install.packages function then you encapsulate the package name in quotes. Uh, note that the package names are case sensitive, so you might have to check that if you're getting warnings. Uh, if you have installed the package, you can say help package equals and then encapsulate the package name in quotes to see what uh, the package contains. And so just uh, with regard to data input and output, um, some of the more useful packages are the foreign package, which reads data from Stata, SPSS, and SAS. The SAS 7 BDAT package, which reads in data from SAS, um, and then the XLSX package, which reads in data from um, Excel. So, for example, if I want to install um, the XLSX package, you typically get this sort of uh, churning symbol where the console's running, 
Um, you have to ensure that you are connected to the internet when you do this. And then it typically installs, um, tries the URL, downloads it, and then if you want to use the package, you would just say library XLSX. And so it typically uh, loads any required packages that that package requires, uh, and then it typically tells you um, that you're good to go, or sometimes you get a warning message if you're using an older version of R, uh, like I am on my Mac side. And so if you say help package equals XLSX, uh, R Studio will pop up um, information in your help file window and this is the name of this package is read write format itself is on seven and it's got this um older Excel version and it describes um help pages are and so if you do want to read it in CSV uh, you can find the readout I'm sorry I'm not sorry you can find the readout in the stuff function and then see on the help page and this is the help page. And so note that I believe foreign is already installed and so there's a bunch of other packs, uh, so you can read in from a database file, you can read in from a DTA file from Stata, and, and various other um, types of data that Foreign provides. Uh, and so, um, so, for example, you can also, uh, you can also uh, designate a repository yourself, but by default it uses CRAN. Um, note that to do XLSX, you need to have a standalone version of Java installed on your computer. Sometimes people get errors with that. Uh, and so if, instead of uh, writing out a file to a directory that's sort of user-friendly and, and openable in something like Excel, sometimes it's useful to be able to just save collections of R objects in an R-type format that you can then read back in for future analyses. For example, if a task takes several hours or days to run, it might be nice to run it once and save the results for downstream analysis. So the function here is save. Um, and so save where you provide as many R objects or functions as you want. Uh, and these, the last command is pretty much file equals, and you give the name of a file, then dot RDA. Um, and so, for example, from the homework, if you want to save the full Charm City Circulator and the reduced Charm City Circulator data set um, as an R object, you would say save designate the two files um, from R, the two R objects, and file equals, and then I say subfolder data, then charm, or then charm circuit RDA. So now, um, this is just a, a file that R knows how to open that contains all the material um, from these two data frames. Uh, so also, you've probably noticed when you've tried to close R, uh, that R prompts about closing your workspace. Uh, and the workspace is pretty much the collection of R objects and custom R functions in your current environment. You can check the workspace with the ls command, or the ls function, or you can view it in RStudio under the workspace tab. So if I were to type ls, I can see all the objects that I have available to me that I have created in R, um, or other ones that I have loaded in, like data sets, like using the data function. Um, and so saving the workspace will save all these files in your current working directory as a hidden file called .rda. So in most operating systems, if there's a dot, it means the file's hidden. Um, this is equivocal to doing the function save.image, which also saves the entire workspace, but lets you give a desired file name, uh, which is nicer because the file's not hidden. Um, note that if you just double-click any .rda object, um, RStudio should be able to open any of them. And so if you open one of these files, it'll typically load all of the objects into your workspace as well as changing your working directory to wherever the file was loaded. So that's nice as well. And so uh, if you want to get the data back into R, use the load function. Uh, you say load and you give the file path. Uh, it can be a relative path or an absolute path. And um, sometimes I like to save it as a variable. So if you don't save it as a variable, it'll, just, it'll load the files into your workspace. Uh, if you do save it as a variable, it saves what you loaded in as a character vector. Um, so now temp contains character vectors of dat and dat2. Uh, but note that these are just describing what you loaded in. You can't do temp dollar sign dat or anything. It's really just a way of uh, letting you know what was in the RDA object that was saved by name. So it's not as nice as something like Stata where you get a full code book uh, that tells you what each of the variables means. Um, but it's still a start to just see, especially if you have a lot of objects already loaded. Um, and so you can easily remove any R object or R objects using the RM or remove functions, and that makes them no longer in your R environment or workspace, uh, which you can confirm by running ls. Uh, you can also remove all objects you've added to your workplace with this command. Um, there's also a drop-down 
that you can use um, under our studio. Um, where it's, here you can say session, clear a workspace. Then it asks you to confirm it, and you can say include hidden objects, and you can say yes, and then everything in your workspace is gone. Um, and then, and so that also lets you sort of start with a clean slate. All right, and so in the, in the last module, we talked about subsetting data briefly. Um, and so often you only want to look at subsets of your data set at any given time. Um, just as a review, elements of an R object are selected using brackets. And today we're going to look at more flexible ways of identifying which rows of a data set to select. And so subsetting data, sometimes you just want to exclude certain observations, and that involves putting a minus sign before the integers um, inside the brackets to remove these indices from the data instead of to extract the indices. So here if I have this vector x, that's numeric, uh, that contains 1, 3, 77, 54, 23, 7, 76, and 5. Recall that if I say um, x bracket 1 colon 3, it takes the first three elements. Uh, now if I do x minus 2, it takes all elements but the second. So you'll note that the 3 was removed. Um, note that you have, you have to be careful with this kind of syntax when dropping more than one element. Um, so you, for instance, if I were to collect 1, 2, and 3, and, and take all observations but that, this would drop the first three. Um, note if you try to use the shorthand, um, you get this error message saying only zeros may be mixed with negative subscripts. And that's because this is trying to set this as a sequence from negative one to three instead of um, extra, uh, removing one to three. So here you'll need parentheses, for example, if you want to remove the first several observations. However, uh, additionally, um, you, you have the ability to select on multiple rows based on the values of two variables. And this involves chaining together logical statements that we covered in Module 4 lecture. And so the two that are most useful are the um, and it's ampersand, which is the and, or a pipe, which is the or. And so the ampersand is um, shift 7, and the pipe is right above the enter, uh, shift um, backslash. And so, for um, and so this basically lets you check uh, a statement like this, which Mondays had more than 3,000 average riders. So you want to uh, extract observations that are both Monday and had daily ridership above um, 3,000. And so here um, we'll, we'll finish this off in Module 4, but which returns the indices that are true for a particular logical statement. Um, and so... Here I'm saying uh, take the day variable and check which ones are equal to Monday, and then take the um, daily ridership and check which ones are greater than 3,000. And so this, I'm just returning the first 20 for the sake of space, and so it, it tells you the indices where this particular statement is true. Uh, and so which days had more than 10,000 riders overall and more than 3,000 riders on the purple line? I'll make this new variable called index. I'll say which, um, which daily ridership is greater than 10,000 and uh, which purple average is greater than 3,000. So there are 280 days where that was true. If I just want to look at the first two rows of um, those observations or those days, uh, I can see I can just do head and then just give two, and I can see it's a Friday and a Saturday, um, July 15th and 16th, and, and purple is indeed above 3,000, and daily ridership is indeed above 10,000. Uh, or is a little more um, inclusive. It can, so this, for example, this I'm making, I'm overriding the variable index. I'm saying which daily ridership is greater than 10,000 or which purple average is greater than 3,000. Um, and so here there's 600 because note this one could be true or this one could be true in order to be returned as true. And so, here, so again, there's 600. And so looking at the first two, um, July 9th and 17th, purple average was above 3,000, but daily average was not. However, that is true, though, because one of the conditions was met. And so note that logical statements cannot evaluate missing data uh, and therefore return an NA. And so, for example, um, if I were to say uh, that dollar sign purple average, the first 10, just which ones are greater than zero, um, note these are all NA. And so when you say which of the missing variables are greater than zero, it returns NA. And so which here extracts out um, the non-missing variables? or uh, it ignores missing values when it returns which ones are true. And so the first day of purple um, ridership was uh, observation 148, for example. 
Uh, if you do have a lot of missing data uh, across many variables, you can use the complete.cases function on a data frame, matrix, or vector, um, which returns back a logical vector indicating which cases are complete, i.e. they have no missing values. Um, you can also select on um, rows where a value is allowed to be in several categories. Um, for example, in, in the homework, uh, we had to subset the charm city circular data set by each day. Um, here, how can we actually select rows that are in one of two days? And so here, the uh, percent in percent operator proves useful um, via the help file. It's a more intuitive interface. It's a binary operator, which returns a logical vector indicating there's a match or not for its left operand. It also returns false for an A. So it's a little bit technical, but if you just look at it in practice, um, the syntax is the variable of interest a day. I'm saying which day is in that I'm collecting Monday and Tuesday. So I'm asking which rows have a Monday or Tuesday. And so the first one's true, the second one's true, the next five are false, um, the eighth one's true, the ninth one's true, the next five are false, um, etc. And if you just put a which statement around that, um, you see which of the indices are true. So that's the first, the second, the eighth, the ninth, the fifteenth, the sixteenth, etc. Uh, and this lets you basically select on more than one. Uh, instead of doing chaining together and statements or or statements, um, this is uh, a faster, more efficient way to sort of extract when things are allowed in multiple, when the same variable is allowed in multiple categories. Um, and so again, we touched on this in the first class uh, in the first day. So you can select columns and variable names using, um, calling them by name in quotes, or you can do it by column indices. So here I'm taking the first three rows and columns corresponding to purple average and orange average. Or if I just want to collect columns seven and five, this is the seventh column and this is the fifth column. So again, that's just a review that you can subset columns in this fashion. And lastly, if you have a data frame, uh, you can remove a column by setting its value to null. Uh, or again, you can you can subset it. You can subset the data frame, subtracting the column that you want to drop. Um, however, you can say temp dollar sign daily. Uh, here, I'm creating a, a a copy of the DAT2, the reduced Charm City circulator data set. I'm saying daily ridership should be null. Now, if I look at the result, the, the data frame after running that command, uh, you'll see there's no more column for daily. And so that's the end of module five. Um, please try to work through the exercises on your own. I'll go over the exercises tomorrow in class. Great. Thanks.